Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this, which is the seventh uh, Shell London Lecture for 2012, entitled Volcanoes and Man. Um, my name is Ted Neild, and I'm the editor of the magazine of the Fellowship, um, which I hope that you all enjoy reading. And if you uh, have never seen it before, then you will be able to find copies not only for this month, but also next month, displayed on the um, mantelpiece outside in the lower library, uh, free to take away. Please take them away. Um, and standing in as I am for David Chilston, the president, I would like to um, thank Shell UK for making this whole series of public lectures uh, possible. Volcanoes, part of the natural environment, um, and for that reason, we have to interact with them. Uh, communities in volcanically active areas are forced to develop um, the sus uh, sustainable strategies for mitigating the risk that they face. Integrating modern strategies of volcano monitoring with, um, and prediction with lessons learned from past events can help us to design an approach to disruption that includes the needs of local communities as well as improved resilience of more distant communities. And that means people like, people like us living here in Britain, subject as we now know we are, to volcanic ash clouds spewing from unpronounceable Icelandic volcanoes that most of us had never previously heard of. So to speak to us today about these issues is Catherine Cashman, a volcanologist who studies links between chemical and physical factors that control magma ascent, eruption, and emplacement on the Earth's surface. Uh, Catherine received her doctorate from the Johns Hopkins University in 1986 and accepted a faculty position at Princeton University where she stayed for five years. In 1991, she moved to the University of Oregon where she holds the position of Philip H. Knight Distinguished Professor of Natural Sciences in the Department of Geological Sciences. In 2011, she took leave from the University of Oregon to move to the University of Bristol, where she holds the position of AXA Research Professor. Uh, she tells me that she has studied volcanoes on six of the seven continents and has seen or visited volcanoes on the seventh. So that's pretty good. Um, she's explored a wide range of eruption styles, including active submarine volcanism, and has served on the Scientific Advisory Committee for the ongoing Soufriere Hills eruption on Montserrat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Catherine Cashman. So it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, both here in the Geological Society, but also here in England. Uh, I've been here for one year, and I have another two in Bristol. And I'm greatly enjoying the entire experience. Uh, just thought I'd put one slide introducing my initial links and understanding of uh, volcanoes and man, or I think of it as volcanoes and society. Uh, in 1980, I was the public information scientist at Mount St. Helens. Um, I, at the time of the eruption, was working on the East Coast for the US Geological Survey. And, a volcano started erupting, and so I whined and begged and pleaded and, uh, to try to get myself out to the activity, and they said I could do it if I would talk to the press. Uh, so that gave me a, a really trial-by-fire introduction to the, the needs of the public, but also emergency managers and uh, county sheriffs and whoever else was trying to deal with what was then an ongoing eruption. I, I was not there for the big event, but I was there for the uh, a year and a half following. And we learned a lot of lessons in 1980, but it seems that uh, every probably 10 years, an event comes along that becomes another signature event, and you have to learn a whole new set of lessons. And uh, as alluded to, the most recent signature event was the one of Eyjafjallajökull uh, yeah, yeah, volcano. <laughs> Even volcanologists have <laughs> I didn't heard of that one um, in Iceland. And it, it actually, um, in Iceland, it was a, a reasonably small eruption. Uh, it affected some people, but it, the winds were blowing toward a fairly sparsely populated reason, region. Uh, but of course, the ash plume from this really fairly minor eruption uh, headed in the wrong direction, as far as you guys were concerned. And as a result, 
Um, these are some estimates I found of the impact. Over a billion dollars cost to the airline industry, um, almost $100 million cost to the airports. There was compensation from all sorts of uh, groups for all the stranded people. Uh, of course, there were the people themselves, and I've talked to people here already who were affected uh, by this event. And it was not just the tourists and the business travelers, but also, of course, all the people associated with the airline industry. And um, you might know that airlines have this very complex network of planes and crew, and I, I talked to someone in the tourist industry who told me it took them weeks, not only to get all the passengers where they needed to go, but to get all the crews and planes back on schedule. And then we also, I think, because of this, became very aware of how global our supply chains are. <laughs> and so um, I think even in the Western US, where I was at the time, uh, it made a big impact. This picture was drawn by a small friend of mine, uh, voluntarily, that she gave to me. And it was her perception of what flying to Europe was like in spring of 2010. <laughs> so <coughs> we, as volcanologists, and really starting with the Mount St. Helens eruption um, for not just volcanologists in the US, but volcanologists worldwide, uh, we very quickly realized that we couldn't just do academic volcanology, but we have to interface with uh, management policy groups and also social science and humanities. Uh, however, I am first and foremost a, an academic volcanologist, and the, the core part of the talk will be me trying to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing from that academic perspective to try to improve our understanding of volcanic hazards. However, as I said, my initial introduction was via the, the media emergency management side, and I've also had a very long interest in historic um, aspects of volcanology. I started life as an English major. I've always been trying to span the, the science-humanities divide. Um, and so I will frame this talk from that perspective, both starting and ending with some things that I've been interested in and thinking about. Uh, so I'm going to be talking quite a bit about uh, explosive eruptions and particularly the processes that give rise to these distal impacts that, that you all worry about um, and that Europe became acquainted with or reacquainted with a couple of years ago. And really these distal impacts are not new, they're just different now because we have a very different uh, complex structure to our global society. But there were uh, dis there have been distal impacts for a long time. Mount St. Helens in 1980, which is, uh, as you heard, my pet volcano, uh, had, at the time of the eruption, as is typical in the western U.S., the winds blow strongly from west to east, and that meant that the ash plume was distributed across the northern uh, part of the U.S., across Washington State, and over... Uh, so across Washington State and then into Idaho and down into Montana. And uh, this meant that people well away from the volcano where they couldn't see it, they weren't really aware of it, uh, were affected in Yakima, Washington by mid-morning. All the street lights had come on because of the darkness caused by the ash. And then the ash cloud moved eastward uh, across Washington into Idaho. And all of a sudden, you had a large number of people who were not really aware that there were volcanoes to the west of them. Uh, all of a sudden, they had to deal with this stuff coming down out of the sky. And volcanic fragments are not like snow. They don't, it doesn't melt. So you actually physically have to do something with it. In fact, in Yakima, Washington, they got very creative. They uh, took a lot of the ass, shoveled it into a landfill, put grass seed on the top, and that's now where their soccer fields are. <laughs> uh, this is a, a little bit of a poem by a, a Northwest um, poet who I like very much. And his description of this uh, impact was roiling earth gut trash cloud tephra 12 miles high, ash falls like snow on wheat fields and orchards to the east, 500 Hiroshima bombs in Yakima darkness at noon. And this darkness at noon theme, you, we can trace back through just about every account 
um, of any type that I've found of explosive eruptions. This is an account from a fairly small eruption in Mexico from 1793. I'm going to turn around so I can read it. Um, where they said the sun was so much darkened that in a radius of more than 15 leagues, it was necessary to use at noon, again, this reference to noon, artificial lights. The birds were so stunned with such an unexpected darkness that they halted where they were, and in some places, partridges could be caught by hand. In the neighborhoods, people assure me that they had never experienced such a gloomy night as on that noon. Uh, this is one thing when you can see the volcano and you know what the source is. It's a very different thing when this darkness comes from far away from a remote source that you know nothing about. Uh, this is a, a story that was written down in the early 1900s um, that was uh, an oral tradition. And the, the person said, um, this is from someone who was in Canada so northeast of Mount St. Helens, and it's recounting an episode from a, a big eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1800. And he said, when my grandmother was a little girl, a heavy rain of white ashes fell. The people called it snow. The ashes fell several inches deep all along the Columbia and for far on both sides. Everybody was so badly scared that whole summer, or that the whole summer was spent in praying. The people even danced, something they never did except in winter. They didn't gather any food but what they had to have to live on. That winter, many people starved to death. So uh, in this case, having this ash come out of nowhere where they had it, no explanation for it, they didn't really know how to react to it. Um, and this, to, just to reiterate, uh, shows that these distal impacts are particularly disturbing because uh, you can't see the, or identify the source. So it's something that comes out of nowhere. And in this way, I think it's similar to the effects of uh, tsunamis on distal communities. And we saw this uh, very dramatically in 2004 when the earthquake in Indonesia generated a tsunami that very rapidly hit uh, Thailand. And you'll remember that people at beach resorts there who didn't feel the earthquake um, were struck by the tsunami. And then that tsunami traveled across the Indian Ocean um, and killed numerous people in Sri Lanka, which is very far from the source. So I wanted to spend the middle part of the talk telling you a little bit about uh, plumes and volcanic eruptions. And from this perspective, or the perspective of this talk, I'm just going to think of volcanic plumes as ash transport devices. Uh, so when I say, uh, plume, and I'll show you some pictures, or this picture is from another eruption in Iceland, and we'll come back to Iceland toward the end. Uh, this was a year after the air eruption, it's, uh, an eruption of Grimsvotten volcano that also triggered some closures of airspace, although not for the duration of the Eyjafjallajökull eruption. Um, so volcanic plumes are uh, initially jets and then buoyant plumes of basically fragments of volcanic uh, particles, usually volcanic glass. I'll show you what that is. And volcanic gases. And then the plumes themselves, as they're rising, they're coming out of the ground hot. They're sucking in air. So they're incorporating air that uh, makes them more and more buoyant. And so initially, they're ejected um, with some momentum, some force, but eventually they turn into some buoyant plumes that rise up. Uh, smaller eruptions generate plumes that stay in the troposphere. Of course, that's where our weather is. So that's something like the air eruption was not a big plume, but it got into the weather systems and was transported in this direction. Uh, very large eruptions generate plumes that go through the tropopause into the stratosphere. And in this case, you can get not only ash that's being transported through the stratosphere, usually right about at the level of the tropopause. And if you remember your meteorology, remember as you go from the troposphere to the stratosphere, there's a big decrease in density. So there's a density contrast there. So the ash 
Uh, the volcanic ash tends to be transported near the tropopause, but you also get SO2 coming out, and that can be higher in the atmosphere. And in fact, that caused some problems in this Grimsvoten eruption um, because initially, of course, everyone was very skittish after the previous eruption, and initially the UK Met Office issued an alert for volcanic ash that had a very large um, area and trajectory. And it turns out that uh, a few days later, they realized that much of this was actually the SO2 plume that was wrapping around uh, the poles. And so SO2, though it's, it's bad for our climate, um, it's not bad for aircraft. So they could release the airspace. Um, so I've mentioned volcanic ash. I thought maybe I should tell you what volcanic ash is. Uh, in some ways, it's not a good term, uh, but it's, it's called ash for a reason, and that is that when people initially saw this stuff falling down, it was like ash from a fireplace. Uh, so that, that's why the word was applied. To volcanologists, we use the word ash just to mean anything that's less than about two millimeters in size. And typically, uh, the material that a volcano kicks out includes individual crystals, so these things with flat surfaces. This is a scanning electron microscope image. That's 20 microns in size. So these are very small particles. You can also see these fragments here. And these are fragments of glass with little bubbles. So they're, they're tiny bits of pumice. Uh, you can also have just ground up rock fragments. And from the perspective of hazards, um, we usually talk about or are concerned with how much fine ash is kicked out by the volcano. And fine ash we talk of is less than about 63 microns. Um, as you get smaller and smaller, then the particles stay sp suspended for longer and longer. So the smaller the particle is, the farther it can be transported. So the more fine ash that a volcano kicks out, then the worse it is for the downwinders. And uh, very small particles, so less than about 10 microns, uh, can be of concern for human health because those are ones that we can breathe in. So from a, a sort of academic point of view, but also from the Met Office point of view of how to try to model these plumes and make predictions for what's in them, um, we need to, or we'd like to know the amount of ash that's in the plume at any point away from the volcano. And so on the one hand, that's going to depend on how the plume behaves. But on the other hand, it's going to depend on what the volcano puts into the atmosphere initially. And there's been a lot of work uh, over the last 20 or 30 years on understanding the energetics of plumes and the relationship between plume height and the type of eruption, um, much, much less is known about what it is that controls what the volcano is kicking out, uh, what we call the grain size distribution. And so I wanted to spend the next little time talking about how we're starting to think about this problem. Because ideally, uh, if we're really going to have efficient predictions and if the Met Office is going to be able to give us uh, a good sense of what airspace is safe and what isn't, then they need to know what they're starting with as well as how it's distributed. So <coughs> how do volcanoes work? Because this is going to control what what the uh, types of particles it is that kicks into the atmosphere. Um, now, I'm usually talking to students. And when I ask the students how many people have either seen the YouTube videos of Mentos and soda eruptions or even done it, I get a lot of people raising their hands. In this audience, how many people have seen the YouTube video? <laughs> All right. <laughs> how many people have, have actually played and tried to do it themselves? Excellent. Um, because if, if this were a, a classroom lecture, then I would have come with bottles of Diet Coke and Mentos, and we'd go outside and, and play with it. 
Um, it's not a perfect analogy for volcanic eruption, but it's a reasonable one. And in fact, I use it in my classes because I, I can get the students to set up testable hypotheses and run some experiments. But the way this works, and for those of you who haven't seen the YouTube, just go Google Mentos soda. <laughs> um, someone, I have no idea who, decided or figured out that if you take Mentos, which are those little sort of chewy mint candies with a hard coating, and you drop them all at once into a large two liter bottle of soda, and it turns out for some reason that Diet Coke seems to work best. Makes you wonder what's in Diet Coke. <laughs> um, if you do that fast, then you can generate quite a high eruption column. And this is mimicking, it's, it's not the same mechanism obviously, but it's mimicking what happens in volcanoes where you drop the Mentos in and that triggers bubble formation. Uh, in a volcanic eruption, the bubble formation is triggered by decreasing pressure, and I'll go over that in a minute. Um, but then you get bubbles that are forming and growing, and that, if the, the liquid is constrained, then that forces the whole column to expand, and so that increases the volume, and it starts accelerating the fluid to the surface. And if it goes fast enough, then even a fluid like Coke will break into droplets. And you can see the droplets on the side there. So that's what we would call uh, fragmentation. Uh, it's, it's taking what was a coherent liquid with bubbles, and it's turning it into individual droplets or particles. So, as like I said, it's not a perfect analog, but it gives us a conceptual model to work with, and that suggests that there's a link between the conditions that control how those bubbles are nucleating and growing and how the volcano explodes or fragments to form particles. So I wanted to take that a little bit farther with you. Um, first, a few more basics. The way or the reason that you form bubbles in volcanic eruptions or in magma is that the volatiles phases in magma, things like water and carbon dioxide, can dissolve in the magma under pressure, but then they come out of solution at lower pressure. So we can put in about 8 weight percent water into a rhyolite uh, at depth. But as we bring that magma up to the surface, then we drop the water content down to almost zero. So all of that water has to come out of the magma and form bubbles. And it's that that's driving the volcanic eruptions. And so that's, that's number one. Number two, then, if you're making bubbles, you can either make lots of little ones or a few big ones. And the balance between lots of little ones and a few big ones is determined by how easy it is for bubbles to nucleate, that is to form individual new bubbles, um, or is it easier to grow the few nuclei that you have. And uh, that balance between growth and nucleation is going to depend on what we call supersaturation, which really depends on how quickly we're bringing magma from depth up to the surface. And again, I'll go back to the, the Coke analogy, or we can use champagne analogy, that's a more fun one. <laughs> um, but have you ever thought about why champagne bottles have thick glass? You know, champagne bottles are different from wine bottles. And in fact, it, it took the development of technology to make thick glass <laughs> before champagne could be um, exported and moved around. And that's because champagne, as you know, has a lot more carbon dioxide dissolved in it than wine or even than beer. And so it has to be bottled under pressure, and the bottle has to be strong enough to hold that pressure. Um, so you know that if you decompress champagne quickly, um, particularly if you've put in some nuclei effectively by shaking it, <laughs> You can do that with, you know, with Coke, too. The reason that, that if you shake it and then open it, the reason it explodes is 
that it, when it's just sitting there, all of the CO2 that has come out of solution is in one effectively big bubble right at the top of the can or the top of the bottle. If you shake it, then you, you put all that gas into the liquid, so then when you decompress, it all expands and you get an explosion. So you never knew that you'd learn all of these things at <laughs> Coke and Champagne at this lecture. I, I am a little famous for my food analogies, so there you go. Okay, there's one other um, thing that comes into play, and that's what we call viscosity, and that's just the stickiness or fluidity of the magma. Um, I've put down here a, a couple of, well, one familiar to you and one maybe less familiar, but familiar to my part of the world, uh, fluids. That's honey and maple syrup. Of course, uh, like the, the magma that I've shown here, um, you can see that depending on the composition of the magma, it has a different viscosity, but the viscosity also depends on temperature, and you know this too. If your honey is too sticky, then you, you uh, heat it up a little bit and it becomes runnier. Uh, magma works the same way. And I'm going to show you the effect of viscosity on fragmentation for two different magma types. One, Hawaiian basalt, which you'll see is, is actually quite close to a sort of coolish honey, if you want to know what it is. And then uh, Mount St. Helens, which is a rhyolite, which note that this is a log scale. So this is about eight orders of magnitude stickier than the basalt. So let's start with Mount St. Oh, no, let's start starting with basalt. Um, so Kilauea Volcano is another place that I've spent a lot of time. You know, it's tough being a volcanologist. You have to go to these awful places, you know, <laughs> Hawaii, <laughs> Iceland. Um, and in the, the mid-'80s, well, 1983 to 1986, when Kilauea Volcano was having these fountaining events about every three weeks. And his fire fountains are quite impressive. Um, when you're standing near them, you hear a, a huge roar, like a, um, standing next to a waterfall. And these are af acting effectively like those Mentos explosions, in that the, the bubbles are forming very close to the surface, they're expanding the magma, it's accelerating, and it's falling apart in what are uh, effectively droplets. And you get a lot of these very fluid-looking bombs that suggest that. Of course, the magma comes out as, and it's hot, and as soon as it hits the air, it cools. So you've got an additional effect of you're starting to cool it. And the, the material that comes out has lots of bubbles in it. So that, again, suggests that the bubbles are nucleating, expanding, and accelerating the magma out. And then it just sort of falls apart. Um, in contrast, if we look at something like Mount St. Helens, uh, where we have a nice big you know, classic, what we call a Plinian eruption, then uh, first of all, you can see that the eruption column doesn't look red like it did in Hawaii. It looks gray. So it's, there's, there's something else going on. That's probably because the magma is fragmenting way down uh, in the volcano rather than up at the surface. So it's already cooled quite a bit by the time it comes out. And if we look closely at the material that does come out, um, we can see that a lot of the ash particles, you can, if you look closely here, you see a sort of a triple junction. And this is the, it was the melt that was forming between the growing bubbles. Uh, but you can see that the particles are angular, and that suggests that instead of a fluid mechanism for disruption, it's actually breaking brittily. So we have two sort of similar models in that in both cases you're forming bubbles rapidly and that's forcing the magma up to the surface. But when we have the low viscosity, like in Kilauea, then the magma is sort of falling apart as a liquid. When we have high viscosity, the magma is actually breaking brittily and forming all those little ash fragments that are so bothersome. Uh, so I wanted to take this one step further, um, and let's think about this. So this is a, a simple model that's been around since the 1950s, and that is that as bubbles come out of solution, uh, you can think of your the, the Coke analogy 
But think of it as if the Coke were really stiff, then the bubbles are trying to expand, but pretty soon they run into each other and they actually call, cause the whole material to, to fall apart. You can't stretch them fast enough. Um, so this is, as I say, this is a concept that's been around for a long time. Uh, but, whoops, there have been, um, it's only been recently that we've been able to test it. And the, the nice thing about this model is if this model works, then the size of the particles that are produced should be directly related and actually we should be able to calculate them if we know something about the bubble formation and the bubble sizes. Um, and in fact, we can calculate it exactly if we have bubbles that are close packed spheres of uniform size. And any of you who know mineralogy could do this. You'll remember radius ratios and you know octahedral sites and tetrahedral sites for the mineralogists out there. However, clearly in pumice, this is a piece of pumice, we have bubbles of varying sizes and they're varying shapes and they're stretched and so it's not quite that easy. Um, but this model does say that we should be able to relate the characteristics of the whole deposit, and remember that's what we're going for, that's what we want to give the Met Office, um, to the properties of the individual particles. And I will walk you through that very quickly. And once again, I'm going to use Mount St. Helens. Um, we know a lot about Mount St. Helens. So one thing that, that's a very basic observation or basic thing we want to know about volcanoes, but it's actually very hard to get, is what was the total grain size distribution that came out during an eruption? And that's very hard to get because most volcanoes have this habit of being near the ocean. And so a lot of the ash gets dumped into the ocean. That happened in the Iceland eruption. Um, and also, as I said, those very fine particles can actually hang up and, and circumnavigate the, the globe. So it's very hard to reassemble and figure out uh, what actually came out of the volcano. Turned out that uh, for the Mount St. Helens eruption, we had two lucky breaks. One is, as I said, the, the winds blow from west to east. And on May 18th, 1980, the winds were blowing very strongly from west to east. So the plume of the, the ash was pretty narrow. So it was pretty well confined. But additionally, something else happened. Oops. Um, and that is, here's the volcano. And these contours are contours of the thickness of the ash deposit. And it turns out that there was a what we call a secondary thickening out here somewhere in eastern Washington. And that occurred because in the northwest of the US, I, I actually feel very home in the UK because to the western side, we also have a lot of wet weather. So there was a lot of water in the air. And when you have a lot of water in the air, then you can get the formation of what are of, of aggregates of ash, what are called accretionary lapilli. So if you take a bunch of little ash particles and you glom them together, then they're going to fall out of the plume well before they would if they stayed as individual particles. Um, so it turned out that there was enough water that basically all the fine material was flushed out of the plume. Then these particles disaggregate when they hit the ground so we could actually measure them. Um, so we can get a total grain size distribution. And I wanted to point out um, that we inherited the grain size measurements from sedimentologists. We have some sedimentologists in the audience. It's your fault. <laughs> We've got this funny scale that uh, means that the, the very small particles are on the right and the big particles are on the left, which is backwards, especially for those of us who are not trained as sedimentologists. So I put the diameter up here for you. But if you look at this, then you can see that um, the pumice, which is what I think most people think of when they think of a big explosive eruption, you think, ah, oh, it forms pumice, you know, that stuff they use to stonewash genes. Um, the pumice was a very small amount of the entire material that was erupted. 
then we have a, a peak right here that's in something that's sort of a millimeter to a quarter of a millimeter size. And most of those were individual crystals that are sort of popping out of the magma. But the peak here is in very small sizes. So these are the size that usually stay up in the plume and also can cause health hazards. Um, as my father reminded me when I moved out there initially in 1980, he was a doctor and he said, don't breathe in the ash, <laughs> which of course was impossible not to breathe in the ash. Um, so you can see that, that Mount St. Helens, there's a lot of very fine material. And it was actually sort of lucky that it was dumped out early. Um, and in fact, we can then make it a direct test of this idea that the bubble size controls the particle size. Um, and here I've done what's called a, a power law plot or a fractal plot. But these symbols are the grain size distribution. And then the circles are bubble size distributions that we've measured in pumice. And you can see that they're exactly the same and suggest that, yes, indeed, the, the bubbles interacted with each other, uh, broke the magma apart, and controlled the grain size distribution. And that's why it was so fine. Um, just one more quick point. Some of you in the audience might be saying, OK, so how do you get pumice if all the bubbles are interacting to form ash? And I asked myself this a long time ago. I've been working on it a long time. Um, I'm not going to go into excruciating detail. But basically, uh, you get ash if the pumice, if the bubbles are not connected. But some of them connect up. And so then gas can es escape, and we can actually model that and uh, make some estimates of if you have certain connectivity or permeability of those bubbles, then we can predict under what decompression rates you'll get large class, that is pumice, or fragmentation to ash. OK, so I spent a long time on Mount St. Helens. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on this other model. Remember, if we have basalt, then we have liquid instabilities that fall apart. And if we look at the grain size distributions, remember, this are coarse particles. These are fine particles. The Hawaiian eruptions produce mostly very coarse particles. They don't produce a little fine ash. They're not a problem. Um, and that is, is certainly because the mechanism by which the fragments are forming is completely different. It's falling apart by liquid. The bubble sizes are much less than the grain size. And so uh, we, we actually don't have to worry about Hawaiian eruptions. We can go see them as tourists. OK, so that's just a summary. These are two end members. Um, I've put together uh, these total grain size distributions for all of the deposits that I've been able to find where people have been able to estimate this. And you can see that there's quite a difference between, this is Mount St. Helens, this purple one, which happens to sit on the, the finest grain size. So these are lots and lots of very small particles. Here's Hawaii. It's on the upper member of the grain size, lots of big particles. You can see we have a spectrum in between. But what I was surprised to see was that all of the eruptions that we would call Plinian or subplinian, all these explosive eruptions, lie in a fairly similar area. These are an intermediate eruption style. These are Hawaiian Strombolian eruption styles. So this says right away, and I went actually down last fall and talked to the Met Office and showed them this. And they said, oh, because right away we could say, well, if you just took a size distribution that's somewhere through the middle there to put into your models, you'd probably be pretty close. And it was very, turns out it was very different than what they were using. And um, I found another size distribution that was used by another group uh, to do some modeling. And here's what they have for their Plinian eruptions. Here's what Mount St. Helens was. The important point is that if we look at the fine ash um, predictions for the plume, they would say that their plumes only have 20% fine ash. Mount St. Helens had 70% fine ash. That's a big difference if you're trying to model what's up there. Um, OK, so, so 
that was the, the intense science part. I wanted to come back to Iceland just because um, it was a fascinating event. And I thought you might want to know a little bit more about it. Um, I was just in Iceland a couple of weeks ago, so I just learned a lot more about it. Um, so let's go back to this eruption. And just so you have a sense, because um, we could be seeing more of these. Uh, there, there are some suggestions that the Iceland volcanoes have been through a time period of sort of a lull in activity, and there's some sense that things may be picking up. Um, and in fact, there was a very famous Icelandic geologist or volcanologist um, who died in the 80s. And his, one of the last papers he wrote was entitled Greetings from Iceland. <laughs> and uh, in fact, the, the Icelanders during the whole, uh, in 2010, because they were still in the, the bottom of their economic crisis, were, were sort of uh, laughing about an ash for cash trade. <laughs> so, so you know something about Iceland. Iceland is what we call a hotspot volcano that sits on the mid-Atlantic ridge. And it has a whole string of active volcanoes that are running uh, to the northeast through this part of Iceland. It also has another system of volcanoes over here that have not been as active recently, although there's some sense that things might be picking up down in that southwest corner. Um, some of the volcanoes that you might have heard of uh, in Iceland, in 1973 there was an eruption of Heimé right here, and there's a great story about that. It was it was a small eruption, but there was a lava flow that was threatening the harbor of Heimé. At that point in time, the Heimé harbor was home to a fishing fleet that was responsible for 12% of the gross domestic product of Iceland. So needless to say, they wanted to save the harbor. And there's a, a really fascinating story about using seawater to spray in the lava to try to protect the harbor. Um, another eruption you might remember, some of you in the room, uh, was the 1963 eruption of Surtsey, which is down there, which is the first volcanic eruption that I remember as a kid. I loved the idea of a volcano erupting out of the ocean. Um, so the air eruption was right here. And it actually involved two separate events. Um, one that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> this one was the start of the eruption. I'll show you a few pictures from that. Uh, and then activity migrated over here. And something that I want to point out and we'll come back to is you can see that this eruption occurred underneath a glacier ice cap. And that was key. OK, so activity started with basaltic activity. It looks sort of like Hawaiian. Um, this, the, I've used various pictures from friends of mine. It's a pretty dramatic event. And you can see it was uh, fairly small fire fountains, a series of vents mostly um, good only for tourists, so people were flocking to, to come watch the eruption. The one sort of dramatic component in terms of ash generation was when lava flows that were going out there went down into a valley and interacted with snow. And so they started forming these explosions and big clouds because the lava was, was heating up the snow and melting it. Um, there were also some bombs that were tossed out, but not anything very huge. So initially, the Icelanders thought, oh, yeah, we have a nice you know, sort of tourist eruption, and they all like going to see them. At least all my friends do. Um, but then oh, I thought I'd give you a tiny bit of background on this. Um, these, this is a timeline. So starting September 2009 through April of 2010, these lines are various measures of how the Earth is deforming. Um, and these rather garish images up here are satellite imagery that's also used to look at how the Earth is deforming. It's something called INSAR. And uh, the gray here is the cumulative number of earthquakes with time. The black are the histograms that are showing earthquakes per day. So you can see that nothing much was happening until January of 2010. Then the earthquakes start to pick up. The ground starts deforming. And it's deforming very rapidly. And the earthquake energy is building up very rapidly um, up to the onset of that flank 
And then things sort of leveled out. And in fact, looking at these plots, you wouldn't necessarily know that something else was going to happen in April. However, um, it did. The, the unpronounceable flank vent shut off on April 12th. And April 14th, uh, this happened. The AFL yokel eruption started. You can see that the plume here has white clouds, and that's just steam. That's from interacting and melting the glacier water. And then there's all the black ash that's raining out. So two major consequences to having volcanic eruptions under glaciers, and the, the Icelanders are fairly familiar with this. The first is that very rapidly the magma starts melting the glacier, and you get what are called yokeloops, which is another um, Icelandic name that's been incorporated into volcanology. In fact, I love volcanology because we have words from Icelandic and Hawaiian and Indonesian and all of these obscure languages. Well, Indonesian's not obscure. There are a lot of people who speak it. But, um, so big glacial outburst floods, but also the interaction of magma with water can generate a lot of fine particles because you have additional energy of the water being flashed to steam. So those two things combined, uh, here are a few really famous pictures of by 947 in the morning, you can see over here, if you look carefully, there's, there's water just gushing out of the base of the glacier. Here's more water gushing out of the base of the glacier. And by uh, 147 that afternoon, this is the main highway, um, Highway 1 in Iceland, that circumnavigates Iceland. You can see that it's been broken in several places by these glacial floods. In fact, I was impressed because uh, a lot of places on this road, <laughs> you can see they, they have these sort of quick temporary bridges that they can put down because they're so used to the road being wiped out by these glacial outburst floods that they, and it's, it's the only connector road around Iceland, so they have to be able to repair them pretty quickly. Um, by the 15th, then downwind areas of Iceland were um, pretty heavily inundated with ash. And uh, I'm going to show you the next picture. A friend of mine was out on this road sampling uh, ash along here to look at the grain size distribution. And uh, from those four samples, the details don't matter, but you can see that all of this ash is less than a millimeter in size. And so it's, it's very small. And it's falling out fairly close to the volcano, again, because you had water in the air, so you're, you're sort of flushing it out. Um, and in fact, up to 70% of the ash was less than that 63 microns. 22% um, of the ash was less than 10 microns. Remember, that's the, lim that's the critical amount for, for respirable ash. Uh, and in fact, if we take a grain size distribution that was developed from a slightly later event that didn't involve glacial water. Even so, it's looking like more like Mount St. Helens than anything else. Uh, so that's what caused the problem, is that we had a lot of uh, fine ash. And it was a fine grain size, partly uh, early on because of interaction with glacial water. But even the later, was people were surprised at how much fine ash there was. Um, it's probably because it, it actually, the, the melt in here, this is a, a scanning electron microscope image. This is, is glass that was a liquid, and we have different types of crystals. Those black things are bubbles. Um, so the melt was actually more like Mount St. Helens in composition than anything else, so it's very viscous. Uh, but additionally, we have all these crystals in here, and it's actually not clear what role those crystals have in causing magma fragmentation. And in fact, that's something that we're working on. Um, and of course, the consequence, again, was that for about an entire week, the airspace over Europe was closed. Uh, I just wanted to point out that for Iceland, the problem really hasn't gone away. This picture was sent to me a week ago by a friend of mine. He was doing work on a glacier to, in southeast Iceland, was driving back along Highway 1 to Reykjavik. There was a strong wind blowing. And he said it was a beautiful, clear blue sky. And then he drove into the ash cloud. And this is just remobilized ash 
Um, so they continue to have problems. So for the last uh, few minutes, I wanted to sum up and say, OK, so what do we do with this information? Uh, where do we go from here? And talk briefly about three different strands that the community, volcanological community, is working on. Um, from my perspective, we still have some basic issues to understand about how fragmentation occurs in more complex materials, particularly ones that have all these little crystals. Um, there's also a lot of work going on um, all over the world, but particularly in Europe, on improving both hazard assessment of volcanoes and risk assess assessment. And there are two things we need to worry about. One is doing a better job during active crises, during Iceland-type eruptions. Um, and the second is that over the long term, we really have to learn to live with volcanoes. And those of us who live with where we can see volcanoes, I think, have known that for a while. But uh, I think the 2010 activity maybe convinced other parts of Europe that this is something you have to live with here, too. Um, Iceland is moving forward quite aggressively. Their meteorological office handles all of their natural hazards. And of course, they were the primary source of information to the European Met offices and the, the Met office here, uh, providing information during the last two crises. So they are moving forward with improved both risk assessment, but also they've started a European consortium that has the great name of Future Volk. <laughs> Uh, and their concept is to try to get um, absolutely every instrument that they can think of uh, deployed either in fixed stations or in portable stations that will allow them to try to get really good estimates of the eruption rate. Because people have, as I said, have good models to tie eruption rates to plume dynamics. Um, people like me are working on trying to tie eruption rates to grain size distributions or source parameters. And so getting a, a rapid and accurate measurement of what the eruption rate is is important to then do very rapid modeling of what's going to happen. Um, there's also quite a bit of work going on in pre-eruption planning. And there was a large group uh, that was really focused on Italy and Vesuvius volcano, which everyone agrees is the biggest uh, volcanic disaster waiting to happen because Vesuvius, for those of you who've seen it, you know it's a very urban volcano. And there are people that are living right up in the flanks. And it's incredibly densely populated uh, around Naples. So if anything were to happen there, it's going to be a mess. Um, so the Italians are working hard on that. And one thing that they're developing is we know that volcanoes usually have a period of unrest before they erupt. So if we have monitoring devices out, we at least know when a volcano is becoming active. Um, the, you can have unrest without eruptions. And then so the, the question when a volcano looks like it's becoming active is, is it actually going to erupt? And if so, of course, when and what type of eruption? And these are these are. Uh, hard to say, but based on looking at past events, they're trying to build up these different scenarios and probabilities. And this is showing um, different scenarios with probabilities of occurrence uh, that planners can use. This is a very uh, the same uh, exercise, but showing the probabilities as distributions. Um, so these sorts of things are being done to try to give emergency managers uh, ways of thinking through what are the possible situations they might have to deal with. And then this type of approach can be updated as you go along, um, as you're moving through a crisis and get new information. Uh, similarly, that project is looking at different scenarios. This particular one was for ashfall probability, given a certain eruption type and a certain wind direction. And they, they also can tell that wind directions change during the year, so there's a seasonal effect. Um, but you can start to make models, and then you can combine 
the asphalt probability models with actually thinking about what that's going to do. And of course, a lot of ash falling on roofs will collapse roofs. So this particular scenario was looking at what are the areas that are going to be affected by roof collapse, but also volcanic eruptions are always associated with earthquakes. So you have shake, ground shaking too. So this is trying to combine and give people a sense of what might happen for a specific eruption scenario. So um, all of these things are, are being played out at volcanoes around the world. Um, we have a long way to go. And it, at the moment, it's mostly in the developed countries that people have the, the time to do this, the time and money. Um, but I wanted to end with maybe, uh, again, back to my humanities roots. And since being at Bristol, I've started working with a historian. Um, she works on colonial Spanish archives in Central and South America. And uh, she found this wonderful painting, or these two wonderful paintings, and contacted the people in the geology department and said, is this of interest to anyone? You know, I was going through the archives. I found these great paintings. Um, they're of a volcano called Tungurawa, which I've actually worked on. And they're both paintings of an eruption in 1773. She was fascinated because there's actually a lot of annotation on them. I, as a volcanologist, was fascinated because there's a lot of information. You can see they very distinctly show two different vents. They show oh, probably pyroclastic flows coming down. This pyroclastic flow blocked the river, and they show that the riverbed is dry on the other side of it. Um, this part, all of this area in brown, is area that was affected by asphalt. So just in these two paintings, there's a huge amount of information of what happened. And we're starting, uh, now Caroline's addicted. <laughs> and so she, about once a week, will email and say, look what I found. Um, and so she's finding historic accounts that provide very precise data on timing and, and what happened, not only of Tungarawa, but also of an event in 1698 in the same area that seems to have affected a volcano called Mount Chimborazo. I won't take the time to read these. Um, but the, the Smithsonian has a global database for volcanic events, and they have no record at all of historic activity at Chimborazo. Now, it's not clear what this, this activity was. They talk about mud flows and lahars and torrents of water pouring out of this volcano. Um, so we're intrigued with that. And we found similar um, curious discussions uh, and descriptions of activity of a volcano with the wonderful name of Volcán de Agua. Um, it's right next to Volcán de Fuego. So you have fire volcano and water volcano right next to each other. Uh, Fuego is active quite frequently. Um, Agua, again, it's not known to be historically active. In fact, the Global Volcanism Database has had an event in 1541 that they discredited as an eruption. That's sort of a slap in the face to poor Volcán de Agua. Um, particularly because, again, it was another of these ones that seemed to put out mud flows. And in 1541, uh, the capital of Guatemala was right there. And so as a result of this activity, they had a discussion. They moved the capital to a place that's now called Antigua. Then there was another event in 1717, uh, also involved mud flows, also is not in the Global Volcanism Database. Uh, and Caroline, the historian, has found that there was this huge discussion at that time of, should we move the capital again? They decided not to. And in fact, they even said, oh, the Italians live with volcanoes. We can manage to do this. <laughs> but then in 1773, there was a large earthquake. And at that point, the Spanish government told them to move the capital to Guatemala City, where it is now. Um, so. <coughs> Hopefully, you've gotten some sense for volcanology, um, but maybe a little bit about interfaces that are starting to develop with management. And then um, I think we need to engage the, the humanities people um, more than we have. And it's, it's a very interesting time, because I think all groups realize that we need to be interfacing and working together. And that certainly was apparent in uh, 2010, where very quickly the Met Office had to get to know the volcanologists and uh, various other folks. So with that, I will end and
Hmm, a little bit. Late, take questions. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, we have a well, we have a tradition here of working our speakers very, very hard. As you know, um, Kathy's going to have to do this again this evening, and she also, in between, has to uh, do a podcast. Um, so, uh, and we're at four o'clock. So, I'd like to take one question from each block, please, um, before we let our speaker go to do her podcast work. And if anybody has to catch a train, uh, please don't be abashed about getting up and leaving. Um, so, if I can now call for a question, do we have any um, microphones, anybody? Microphones? No, we're not getting any microphones. Never mind. Normally, I would say at this point, you wait for the microphone because uh, we have to have microphones, otherwise people on the tape won't be able to hear us, but... I, okay, I, I, can, I can repeat it questions. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Well, because it's not, it's not for us, it's for, you know, right. it's for all these millions of people who right. are waiting out there. Well, know, I was going to say, I can repeat, your, your, your I can repeat the question. You can repeat the question. Right. I'd like to take, to take one question from here, please. Gentleman over there in the corner. Um, I don't know whether it's fair to ask you this because you haven't specifically mentioned CO2 emissions. But can I go on? <laughs> uh, there was a, uh, some controversy two or three years ago about the relative emissions from the sub area of Volcano Lake and the next door from Volcano Lake. And the climate is expected to try to argue that the emissions from the sub area of Volcano Lake vastly. Right, subaerial? You, you mean submarine? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Sub okay, subaerial is, is in the air and submarine is oh, underwater? Sub okay. Okay, there was a question about the uh, impact of CO2 from volcanoes on climate. Um, I'll say right off that that's, that's not my area, um, but there, I, I'm not, I don't quite understand the argument of the submarine versus subaerial. Uh, we do know that not only do active volcanoes emit CO2, but there are uh, large areas around volcanoes, particularly in um, Italy, where there's, there are large CO2 emissions from the ground even when the volcanoes are not active, as it were. So volcanoes are certainly um, a, quite a large source of CO2, and they, in the past, um, there, there's very clear evidence of association between what are called large igneous province eruptions, so this very large... Um, basalt flow eruptions with major extinction events and climate change. In fact, I just was at a lecture yesterday by a, a retired <laughs> professor from Harvard um, who has worked a lot on what's called the Snowball Earth Model, or back in the Precambrian. And he had just come from a meeting last week uh, where people presented new data dating one of these large igneous provinces and it is right at the same time that you went into this so-called snowball earth mode. Um, there's controversy about whether the, the entire earth was frozen and whether the oceans were frozen, but certainly it was a time period where there, there's evidence that large continental glaciers covered most of the continents. So um, in terms of what, what CO2 is contributing now versus humans, uh, I think for me the critical thing is that volcanic emissions, um, the large term, except when you have one of these large igneous provinces, are pretty steady. And we've clearly seen dramatic increases in CO2 uh, with humans. And there has not been a, a, a similar or any indication that the volcanic activity has picked up in any way during that time period. So that would be. <laughs> my short-term response to that. Thank you. Uh, we now have microphones. Um, uh, can I take one question from the center block, please? Gentleman at the back. The city of Managua, 
was destroyed three times during the 20th century. And after each disaster, the government very gallantly said, we will rebuild in the same place. And that is exactly what they did. Now, bearing in mind uh, the Managua uh, problem and the potential disaster for Vesuvius um, and other volcanoes, uh, isn't it time, we said, these areas must be kept clear because we are not going to be able to save these people. Well, of course, that's a critical problem. Um, and another example of that is in 1985, there was an eruption of Nevada del Ruiz volcano in Colombia. It was a relatively small eruption, uh, but it triggered one of these large mud flows that went through a town that had been destroyed by mud flows in the, seven, or in the 19th century and then again in the 16th century, um, and 23,000 people were killed. Um, the, I've, I know a volcanologist there, and initially they tried to keep that area free, but people are moving back. Um, and it's, it's an issue because in that case, um, a lot of the, the, there's not much flat land to, to live on, and so there's, there's land pressure. Um, there's also, you know, there are political reasons for rebuilding their economic reasons for rebuilding and for not rebuilding. Um, so it, it's really the will of the government and also um, the er eruption frequency. And I know that this, an, an example of the government actually doing something temporarily from my country was in um, 1993, there were big floods of the Mississippi River. And in that case, and it's the first case First good example that I know of, uh, there were towns that our Federal Emergency Management Agency told people they would not fund them to rebuild, that they had to move the town. Um, but they were small towns. And of course, we have New Orleans. And you know, we saw what happened in, in Katrina. But um, New Orleans has been a disaster waiting to happen for a long time. But there's, there's so much economic uh, investment there that it's very difficult to even talk about moving people. So that is one of the big challenges, and that's why the Italians are, instead of talking about moving Naples, um, they're trying to be very proactive with their monitoring, but also their uh, emergency response planning. And I know a few years ago I was talking uh, to a colleague there, and he said that every small community in Naples is actually paired and has a sister city or sister village somewhere else in Italy. And the kids actually do school trips back and forth. And they're, they're trying to set up um, a mechanism for if they have to do a fairly long-term evacuation. Because of course, one of the problems is people always feel displaced and they don't want to move to a new place. So they're trying to develop ties between different small groups with different places in Italy um, in the event that they do have to do a major evacuation. Uh, but that's the big challenge we have. You know, populations, the global population is growing. And people, the, the problem actually is that in a lot of places, people are moving into dangerous areas that they didn't live in before just because they don't have other places to live. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and from this block, anybody? Yes. There we are. There's the microphone. You have a marvelously great experience in the volcanology. You have told that the overpressure leading to the fragmentation and leading to the gas <laughs> escape. If you know very well the pressure and know the velocity of elevation of the magma, you can easily calculate the time, the opening time, between the absolute time and opening time. But you told the most important thing about the stratosphere. If the tremendous fragments going up to the stratosphere, 
my question is eventually what happening in the stratosphere some kind of sulfates or any other chemical composition right i uh, the the question about what happens in the stratosphere i didn't touch on at all and that's another important component or link that volcanologists have made in the last 20 years is with atmospheric chemists because as you alluded to I just sort of mentioned there was that SO2 layer up there, uh, but when the SO2 is in the stratosphere, it actually interacts with incoming radiation and um, it can, can actually block incoming radiation um, with the, the various reactions that are going on. So we have very nice documentation, for example, from that Mount Pinatuba eruption in 1991 that the global temperature decreased for a year or so afterwards. Of course, the most famous example of that historically is uh, there was a, a very large eruption in Indonesia in 1815 of Tambora. Um, it caused what has been known as the year without a summer in New England, where I grew up. So there was snow in July and August. Um, massive crop failure, of course. Uh, it also has probably gave us um, a, a famous piece of literature, the, the book Frankenstein. <laughs> I don't know if people have heard the story, but uh, the Shelleys and Lord Byron were at a summer house in Lake Como, and the weather was so dreary, uh, sort of like this summer, I think. <laughs> anyway, it was so bad that instead of going walking outside, they decided to have a, a contest to see who could write the best ghost story. And, uh, the, the uh, history says that the, the ghost story that won was the, the book that, or the story that actually became the book, Frankenstein. Um, so that had noticeable climate effects for a few years afterwards. Uh, also, the Lockheed eruption in Iceland in 1783 um, caused bad acid fogs in Europe, and several people have suggested that, that those acid fogs caused the crop failures um, over the next three or four years that probably had a role in triggering the French Revolution. So, uh, I, yeah, I talked about ash because it was ash that was the problem in 2010, but certainly uh, there's, there's big concern that if you had another Lockheed type eruption, uh, there would be bad sort of acid rain, acid fog problems here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, anybody um, who wants to put people into an equation deserves admiration. But if anybody wants to put Neapolitans into an equation, <laughs> they deserve a round of applause. Thank you very much.